Hello and welcome to this video which is all about the Young's modulus. Before we start on the Young's modulus we need to define a couple of quantities. The first one is stress. Now in a solid material stress is defined uh, like this. It's defined as the applied force divided by the area normal to the force. So effectively the cross-sectional area of the material at right angles to the force that's being applied. So it's sometimes given the symbol sigma, lowercase sigma, Greek letter, um, and it's equal to the force divided by the area, the cross-sectional area normal to the applied force, at right angles to the applied force. Now, because it's force over area, it has the same units as pressure. So it's commonly measured in pascals. That's the SI unit for stress, just as it is the SI unit for pressure. And that's equal to newtons per square meters because it's force over area. Okay, so that's stress, applied force over cross-sectional area, normal to the force. The second quantity that we need to define is called strain. Now, strain is defined as the extension of the material, which is the length minus the original length, the extension, as we looked at in the last video, divided by the original length of the material. So that's commonly given the symbol epsilon, Greek letter, which is X over L, Extension divided by original length. And because it's extension over length, extension is measured in meters. Length is measured in meters. Meters over meters cancels out. And therefore, strain is a unitless quantity because it's just a ratio of lengths. It has no unit at all. So that's stress and strain. Now, if you test a material and you calculate its stress and strain and you put them on a graph, the graph will look like this. Stress on the y-axis strain on the x-axis, strain in newtons per square meter, sorry, stress in newtons per square meter, as we've said before, strain with no units at all. You get the same sort of graph as you do with the Hooke's Law experiment when you're just plotting force against extension, and that's because stress is force over area and strain is extension over original length. Now, because cross-sectional area and original length are constants, then this graph is actually proportional to the force against extension graph, which is why it has the same shape, but it's not the same graph. It's important to realize that this is a stress against strain graph rather than a force against extension graph. And although the two are very similar and are related, they are different. Okay, so in the straight line section here, where we've got this proportional relationship between stress and strain, we can calculate the gradient. The gradient of this graph is equal to what we call the Young's modulus. Now, the Young's modulus is an inherent property of the particular material that we're interested in. And because it's the gradient, it's equal to the stress divided by the strain. Okay, and that's actually how the Young's modulus is defined. It's the stress divided by the strain. Okay, so that's what we're doing there. We're calculating the gradient of a stress against strain graph to find the Young's modulus. So stress over strain is the same as force over area divided by extension over length. And if we simplify that a bit, we can get that the Young's modulus is equal to the force multiplied by the length. If we invert and multiply these fractions divided by the area times the extension. All right. And that's a good way to calculate it, to remember that little equation there, because that'll help you if you've got basic quantities and not stress over strain. Sometimes the Young's modulus is given the symbol Y, sometimes it's given the symbol E, capital E, and I don't quite know why, um, but yeah, so those two symbols are interchangeable. Um, now the, the Young's modulus is slightly different to the force constant, because obviously we can calculate the force constant by doing force over extension. The force constant is specific to that particular piece of material, that particular shape, size, dimensions. The Young's modulus is a is um, a property of the material itself. So the Young's modulus of steel, for example, is the same, whatever the, your shape of steel, although a steel spring and a steel girder will have a very different force constant, but they will both have the same Young's modulus because they're both made of steel. All right, so it's inherent to that particular material uh, rather than the piece of material that you're interested in. Um, now, there's a very important experiment that you need to know in order to determine the Young's modulus. Um, uh, and in that, you need to measure the cross-sectional area of the material before you stretch it and the original length of the material as you stretch it. 
So both of those are constants. So I'll just put K against those. Um, and you also need to measure the applied force and the extension of the material, and those two are variables. So in order to calculate it, you, you take a piece of material, you put it under load, you plot the, you, sorry, you tabulate in a table, you, you put the applied force and against the extension. So you've got two columns in your table, applied force and extension, and then you can calculate the Young's modulus by doing uh, force over area, so these two together, and extension over original length, so these two together. These top two give you stress, and these bottom two give you the strain. Okay, so when you've, you've used all four of these things to calculate the stress and the strain, you just plot one against the other and calculate the gradient of that graph, and that'll give you the Young's modulus. Okay, so that's how it's done experimentally. Okay, now Young's moduli, Young's moduli are very different for, very, for, for different types of material. Um, an example of uh, a brittle material, something that doesn't stretch very much before it breaks, uh, looks like this, where you have a very high Young's modulus, typically, so you're very, very high gradient, a very steep gradient. And for a flexible material, like rubber, for example, you would have a low, much lower um, Young's modulus for that particular material. Um, here's a little chart which shows you some Young's modulus of various different materials and you can hopefully see that there's a general upward trend but that trend is very varied. There are very, lots of different uh, values um, and it's not a particularly close trend, not a good correlation. But different types of materials tend to uh, gather in different areas of this graph. Um, so we're talking about Young's modulus up this axis. Uh, the density is kind of irrelevant for our purposes here, but it, this is a, a graph of Young's modulus against density. Now this is a, a logarithmic scale, as you can see. This is 1, 10, 100, 1,000. High Young's modulus materials are stiff, and low Young's modulus materials are flexible. And you can see foams, rubbers, and polymers being quite flexible, having l low Young's modulus values. And... Um, stiff materials such as ceramics and metals and composites and things like that having high Young's modulus values. Now these are measured in gigapascals, so this is typical. You tend to get very large values for uh, the Young's modulus. 10 to the 9 pascals, 10 to the 10 pascals is not unusual. And the reason for that um, comes right back to uh, of our, our uh, definitions for stress and strain. Um, the applied force tends to be very large compared to the area, the cross-sectional area, which gives you a large value for stress, uh, whereas for strain, the extensions tend to be quite small compared to the actual length of the material. So you get very small values for strain. So with large values for stress and low values for strain, when you calculate the Young's modulus, which is stress over strain, you tend to get very large values for the Young's modulus, which is why... Um, all the things on this graph are in gigapascals. Okay, so that's the Young's modulus. The other thing you need to know is what the stress against strain graphs look like for various different categories of materials. So the first one we've got here is a brittle material. Uh, this is what the stress against strain graph looks like for that type of material. So hopefully, as you can see from this graph, um, when you place a large amount of stress on a brittle material, it results in very little strain. So for large forces, you get little extension. Um, effectively, they don't stretch very much. And then there's a very small plastic section, if any, where you get this non-linear section of the graph and then the material will break. So the end of this stress strain graph where the line stops is the breaking point of the material breaking point. Okay, so that's that point there. Um, so large Young's modulus, little extension for a large amount of stress, um, and then they break very quickly. And an example of a brittle material is glass. So anything that smashes like this is uh, a typical brittle material. <clears throat> Another type of material is a ductile material and you can hopefully see immediately the difference between the stress strain graph, graph for this and the stress strain graph for the brittle material. Here we've got a lower value typically of the Young's modulus 
and the very large nonlinear section where the material will stretch um, quite a lot before it breaks and obviously this is the breaking point at the end here so after this point smaller um, additions to the to the stress on the material will result in large amounts of strain so it'll stretch quite a lot for little uh, extra uh, forces added to it the point right at the top of this curve i.e. the maximum stress about this point here um, is called the ultimate tensile stress and the ultimate tensile stress is defined as the maximum stress a, a material can withstand before breaking. Now beyond this point you can apply less force, less stress to the material and it will still extend effectively, there will be more strain placed on it um, but you don't have to apply quite so much stress to extend it further but it's the top of the graph, the maximum stress that you can possibly apply to the material. So that's a ductile material and a typical example of a ductile material is a metal, not him, we're talking about the spoon here. So uh, ductile materials can typically be stretched out into wires so that's why that's one of the reasons why metal is a very good material to be made into wires because it's ductile. Okay, so the third type of material is what we call a polymeric material. Now polymeric material, the stress strain curve looks like this. There's usually no, st no straight line section at all. It's all um, curvy. But the key point about a polymeric material is it follows a different line when you load the material, i.e. when you apply force, you add extra force, to when you unload it, i.e. when you take force away, when you reduce the force on the material. So the extension is different when you load it as to when you unload it. And that gives you an area. Now the technical name for this area is hysteresis. And this hysteresis in here, the area between the loading and the unloading lines is the energy dissipated as heat. So this energy, uh, this area here is, is the energy that is lost when you load and then unload, you stretch and then let the material return to its original length. And that's a polymeric material. And a typical example of a polymeric material is your stretchy rubber man. So when you stretch it and then release it, it will return to its original length, but it will also heat up. There will be energy lost during that process. Okay, so that's all you need to know on the Young's modulus and different types of materials. So thanks for watching.